For our final morning session, we've got one more billion dollar question. The internet taking on television. Who wins, who loses in this multi-platform global battle to give viewers what they want, where they want it, and how they want it? To explore both sides of that equation, we're delighted to have with us Robert Kensel, YouTube's global head of content, along with Ward Platt, President Asia Specific, Asia Specific and Middle East of Fox International Channels, and they'll be talking with Rob Budden, Chief Media Correspondent of the Financial Times. Welcome to you all. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rob Budden. I'm the Chief Media Correspondent at the FT. Um, today we're going to debate the battle for the living room. Our viewing behavior is changing. Most of us are watching more TV, but we're doing it on different devices inside and sometimes even outside the home. And we've also got new platforms and new competitors challenging the traditional broadcasters. So how are our viewing habits going to change, and what does this mean for the commercial models? With, us, with me, I've got Ward Platt, who's president of Fox International Channels Asia, and Robert Kinsel, who's vice president of TVN Entertainment at YouTube. Um, so, Ward, I thought I could probably start with you. I, I touched briefly on the way that we're watching TV is changing. I thought it'd be in, useful to just define what exactly do we mean by living room? Um, I think that the good news is that five years ago, people were worried about people moving from the living room to the study and doing everything on their PC. I mean, the good news is I think in most households everything is moving back to the living room and the center of the living room still is the big screen TV they have in, in the living room. But obviously on that TV, I think 90% plus of the time they're consuming content delivered in a traditional uh, way through broadcast television or pay TV, uh, linear television. But increasingly, of course, they're also deliver, uh, watching content on that screen through uh, content ultimately that's delivered through the internet, whether it's a subscription-based service like Netflix or Hulu Plus or a free service uh, like YouTube or, or, or Hulu, the main Hulu service. Um, and, it, and the second thing that's happening is they're actually sitting in front of that television with another device usually and interacting in some way um, with what's on the so, you know, I, I think it has changed from where people thought it was a fight between the living room and the PC. I think that's changed. But the question is how people consume that content in the living room and how they interact with other people in the room with them and how they're interacting with their friends at the same time as things are being broadcast on the television. Yeah. And Robert, do you, do you see it the same way? Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, for us, it, it all depends on what part of the world you live in. Uh, there are certain parts where mobile consumption, and I define mobile as anything uh, from an iPad down to 11 inch screen and down. Uh, so mobile is a very significant portion of, of consumption and in some markets it isn't. Uh, as a matter of fact, Saudi Arabia is a market with the largest mobile penetration for YouTube. 50% uh, of all of our consumption is taking place on these things. So when we talk about the living room, to us, the living room is right here in your pocket and, and goes with you wherever you are. Uh, Korea is another fantastic market for mobile. As a matter of fact, for us, mobile consumption has gone from 6% of all of our viewership 18 months ago to 25%. And this is on the average across the whole world. 6% to 25% in just 18 months. It's a massive consumer shift uh, uh, that signifies the, the power of mobile. And again, as Korea and Saudi Arabia show us, it can be as much as half. So um, that is actually a good thing because there is, uh, there is a lot of great content that is being delivered over the television that is delivering a lot of value and that people are paying for or watch the ads and support the ecosystem. And what's developing in addition to it is services and platforms such as YouTube that are oriented in a different way on a mobile uh, platform, uh, which means we're not really competing, right? So when, you know, the, the name of this panel is the war of the living room, 
uh, we're not really at war at all. Uh, we are complementary because our primary mode of consumption is much smaller device than the one uh, that a living room is anchored on. So I view, I view this actually as a very peaceful coexistence that simply expands the viewership consumption and everybody ends up being happy. Yeah. Um, and Robert, I believe that YouTube sees what's going on, the changes happening in TV at the moment being as big or even bigger than the changes we had decades ago with the arrival of cable, TV and pay TV. Can you just sort of explain this vision and, and sort of give us a sense of where you think we're going? Sure. Uh, so I, I've worked in the internet delivered uh, video industry for quite some time. Uh, I ran the content uh, streaming content acquisitions for Netflix uh, for seven years. And every single year I was uh, basically asked the same question and is this the end of television as we know it and is it all changing? And so far all of the consumer metrics, uh, time spent, cable subscriptions, satellite subscriptions, show the opposite, that the TV ecosystem is actually very healthy. I watch a lot of television um, while I'm consuming a bunch of other uh, digital media. So I, I view at the internet delivered experiences as complementary to the value that television delivers. Television has one huge advantage, which is the one-to-many distribution uh, system, which helps deliver ton of million viewer audiences concurrently. You could not do that on the internet today. Uh, Super Bowl in the United States, 100 million viewers at the same time. Globo delivers 100 million viewers every single day on their soap operas in Brazil. You could not do that over the internet, which means the internet firms such as ours are focusing on distributed man content, are focusing on shorter form content, uh, they're focusing on the things which may be less uh, well done on television and therefore complementary to what television is. So the future as I see it is uh, television remains healthy because it delivers tremendous value that the internet, can, internet uh, based firms can deliver. But the internet based firms will deliver a whole bunch of other experiences that you currently don't find on TV. For instance, a yoga channel on YouTube. You won't find it on television because it's too small for any given market. Because we're a global platform, we can assemble all the yoga enthusiasts from all around the world and actually create a viable uh, avenue for a channel that is focused just on that interest. And you can go down many different interest areas and, uh, and start imagining the future. And just like cable expanded broadcast over the last few decades, there used to be four, three, four broadcast channels in every country. Now we have hundreds of cable channels expanding that. Uh, you can imagine that the internet, and I hope that YouTube plays a large uh, role in that, will expand the cable ecosystem by providing uh, another, you know, few more hundreds or thousands of channels around narrower interests which are not served on television. So, Ward, do you, do you see it the same way? I mean, is this a threat or is this an opportunity for the broadcasters? Mostly in agreement as well. I mean, the, I mean, let's look at the international. Jeff talked this morning about, you know, the connectivity of the international markets is growing so fast and ultimately in turn media consumption because of connectivity, whether it's through traditional TVs or through internet connected devices. But there's so much growth happening that there's plenty of room, I think, for traditional, I mean, those who are well organized, traditional players or new media players are in a very good position to prosper from this international growth. And, and it, as Robert said, I mean, the, you have a full range of product, you know, cable TV started the, the, the creation of more niche channels 30 years ago. But obviously with the internet now, that's gone to a whole new stage where you can create thousands of niche channels, whereas there's a limit um, through linear television, through traditional delivery means for how much niche product you can create. Um, so there's, but, but at the other end of the spectrum, yeah, you have live news, you have live sports, you have near live, the newest TV show, whatever it is that people want to experience together with their friends. There's still certain things that are lend themselves much better to um, traditional um, broadcasting. And ultimately, I mean, there's more windows being created, and that's that's good. I mean, we every time I think over the last 20 years, people worry when a new window is created, DVDs come out or uh, video on demand, all these new windows come about, and you think that's going to somehow ruin the industry. It's only made the industry prosper because people do consume media in all these different windows, and sometimes they want content quickly, 
for and they're, they're willing to pay a lot of money for it, and other times they want content for free and they're willing to wait um, two or three years to get it. So I, I think there's going to be more windows and those windows overlap. And sure, I think some of the internet delivered solutions will overlap with some of the traditional solutions. But I, I think there's plenty of room for everyone. And what about you touched on the second screen? Increasingly, more and more people are looking at another device while they're on TV. So what are there opportunities there for broadcasters? Have, been, have been broadcasters been a bit slow to tap into that trend? I think, yeah, the answer is I think traditional broadcasters have been slow, but I think it, it's changing now and, and that effort is accelerating because there is an awareness that new media players are, are moving fast in that space. I mean, for instance, in, in our business, we would have, we have authenticated uh, catch up on demand services for many of our products. So if you're a linear subscriber to our movie channel in a country through your set-top box, you can see many of the movies that are available you know, through the set-top box on an on-demand basis. And now you can, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, applications for your smart TV and for the iPad and for and a website where you can go and you authenticate once to prove you're a subscriber to your linear channel. And you can watch those same on-demand uh, movies on your tablet out of your home, on your mobile phone out of your home. Um, and we're extending that into sports and lifestyle and, and entertainment content, local uh, production, not just US entertainment. So, but obviously that's just the first step and we have to keep evolving, but there are certainly, you know, we, the traditional players have invested a lot of money in the industry and, and built successful industries, uh, businesses, because they have both pay and, and free, uh, sorry, they have um, subscription revenue and advertising revenue and are reinvesting that and creating really good content. And they're packaging all that good content and good brands. But if we don't extend those brands beyond the traditional linear television environment, I think you know, we'll be in big trouble. So, um, Robert, I also want to talk to you about the content. I mean, you're moving more aggressively into professional content, I suppose, would be a, a way of um, talking about it, away from user-generated content. I wanted to talk a bit about what, what your ambitions are there, but also get a sense of what your business model is there. Is this going to be largely ad-driven, and how would that work, or is it going to be also subscription-driven in the future? Sure. So, uh, um, number one, uh, we have and we've built our business on uh, user uh, submitted content, right? user generated content. And to be frank, user generated content is our greatest gift uh, because it means that you have incredibly distributed supplier base, more so than any other business on earth, uh, other than Google search. And, um, and it means that you have an ongoing flow of content that people are interested in watching. So uh, we, uh, what we're working on is figuring out how we mesh content created by users together uh, with content created by professionals. And even the word professional is very difficult to define because there are many great examples of content creators who started on their own in the makeshift studio and now have developed uh, into full-fledged professionals on YouTube. Michelle Fan uh, is a great example. She's a makeup artist who started a uh, channel focused on making beauty accessible to everyday women. And uh, she has become tremendously successful with great sponsorships now by Lancome. And, uh, and she, has a, she has bigger ratings than the Style Network in the United States. So what we're looking to do is different than what's on TV. We're not looking to take necessarily just TV programming and, and sort of pipe it through YouTube, even though we do that as well. What we want is for creativity to take a new form. Uh, content doesn't have to mean 22 minutes or half hour or one hour. Uh, it can be defined by what the co content creator wants, to, wants it to be, so long as there's an audience that follows it. And we see great traction with that. So in the United States, uh, last year we decided to forward invest and instead of, uh, and take essentially what we used to pay out on revenue sharing to content providers and forward invest in minimum guarantees to, to stimulate the creation of new brands, whether it was with existing partners or new partners coming to us. And, uh, and they are creating many different types of content from uh, soap opera channel uh, for women uh, created by John Abnett and Rodrigo Garcia for like the Hollywood royalty to uh, you know, pet channels sponsored by uh, by Acme. You know the uh, you know food uh, uh, food firms. So there are many different forms that con content take, can take on, and we want to harness them and bring them to people in a UI that is somewhat akin to TV, where you can save your favorite channels to a guide, and then travels with you to your phone, your iPad, 
television wherever the YouTube software is embedded. So our approach is different than from television, which is again, it takes me to the fact that we're not trying to uh, go after television and, and go into any kind of war uh, for the living room. Uh, we're merely looking at the white spaces in programming and see how can we fill them very much the same way that cable networks, you know, with, uh, owned by the major media companies have done over the last 20, 30 years. There used to be no ESPN, there used to be no CNN, there used to be no Nagio. Right, those spaces were not filled, and the cable networks fill them. Uh, we look at it exactly the same way. We look at the white spaces and see how we can provide value and contribute and fill those spaces. And it's amazing for us to also see the traction in uh, Middle East, where uh, you know filmmakers from Middle East are winning competitions that we put together. You know the YouTube Film Festival, your Film Festival, uh, the uh, Space Lab program that's done by us. We do a lot of great programs where we sort of see where talent is coming from, and a lot of the talent is coming from MENA, which is really exciting to see. And will you ever charge for premium content? And uh, I'm sorry, didn't address that. So the natural extension, so what we do, our business model today is fully ad-supported. Uh, we believe that, I mean, we don't believe, we know that that is our strength. Uh, Google is an ad-supported company. We have a very large business, uh, huge uh, ad sales force of 11,000 people. So there's a scale uh, advantage that we can build off of. The same is happening to us at YouTube. Uh, we have a very large, you know, we're 100% ad supported. Uh, we've developed a very inno inno innovative way to display advertising through a skippable ad format called TrueView, where viewers only watch the ads that they care about. And if they don't, they can skip them. Advertisers only pay for the ads which are being watched. When, when that happens, they don't mind paying more. When they pay more, the content owner makes more, everybody's happy, viewers watch. So we're taking the friction out of it and we're betting the company on the skippable ad format, which is something you can't do on TV. It's completely uh, dependent on the two-way nature of the internet. And, uh, and we're applying the auction to it as well to help uh, drive uh, the prices to its true value. So that's our strength. However, that alone, as Ward mentioned, sometimes isn't enough. Sometimes you need two revenue streams, and dual revenue stream model is something that we love on television. It's, it's a, it makes it a very robust business. So you will see us over time introduce an option uh, to all of our channel partners to, uh, to start charging subscriptions for their content in addition to realizing the revenue stream from advertisements. So it's, you know, the business of television has uh, has done it right, you know, has developed a robust economic system and and we'll have that option. We will make that requirement and content owners will decide whether that is something that they want to, to uh, implement or not for their channel. So I would say in the future on YouTube you will see the majority of channels ad supported and there will be some that will be paid and, and there will be different types of programming in each based on what it costs to attain the programming. So Ward, this sounds like internet companies going more into your world. They're introducing pay channels, they're creating their own content and adding their own content. What does this mean for broadcasters like yourselves? And, and do you, um, well, how, 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 you know, how would you react to this? Yeah, look, I, I think ultimately, yeah, more competition is actually a good thing. And while we may, we're not directly competing over time, I'm sure we bump into each other. and. We're moving from one place to another, and they're moving from one place to another, and we'll probably be closer together in five years than we are today. But that's a challenge, and competition's good in that sense. I mean, we, you know, we, we have internationally in the last 10 years grown from less than 30 channels to more than 300 channels outside of the U.S. And that's a very simple model, which is to replicate the U.S. model, which is let's create pay TV channels, a pay TV channel business where we have dual revenue streams. Let's create, buy, create, and own really good content and package it through really good content delivery vehicles, ultimately brands like National Geographic and Fox, and get you know people to pay for that, and then ultimately also monetize eyeballs uh, for that. And you know I think for us increasingly, there's a flight to quality. I think we have to focus on creating, it can be in a particular niche, but we have to create and own good sports content, create and own good US series content, Hollywood movies, local shows and uh, variety shows in Taiwan, movies in the Philippines, whatever the market is, our focus certainly as a pay TV channel provider is we have to justify what we're charging the subscriber and the best way to do that is by bringing the very best possible content 
to the subscriber. And in today's world, there's so much good content being created, whether it's mass content or, or niche, the consumer has their niche interests and their mass interests. They have so much there that if you don't have the very best content at that point in time, if you have the second or third best, then someone may say, oh, I'll watch the best, and next week I'll watch the second best thing. But by next week, there's so much new stuff that you may have forgotten what was second best last week. And so even when movies launch in the movie theater now, if you're not the, you know, if you launch two blockbusters at the same time, one of them is going to be a failure. And that's crazy, but that's just the way it is because people decide, you know, which one they're going to go to. The same with TV and the rest. So I think it's becoming more challenging. There's so much content out there that a pay TV provider has to really provide really strong content. First run, exclusive, very close to global broadcast date, um, on demand through all devices, you know, over any platform possible. And they have to do it quickly because if they don't, you know, it'll be forgotten. Sure, yeah. Um, you, po you posed your question as competition. Um, the best way to think about, at, le at least as it relates to YouTube, the best way to think about YouTube is a platform just like Sky. We're not a TV channel, just like HBO or just like any broadcast channel. We're a platform, just like Sky, that gets other programming brands to distribute their content through us. That's it. So uh, when we sit here together, uh, they're not a platform, they're a programmer with a suite of channels that they distribute over other people's platforms. If we provide them the economic uh, framework to distribute their channels through us, they will. If we don't, they won't. But it's not competition, it's a supplier and a uh, buyer relationship. And so today we don't offer pay, pla pay platform on YouTube. Most of their business, if not all, is through pay platform. So it makes sense that their channels currently are not on YouTube. If we ever do that, uh, which we will at some point, then it may make sense for them to do it. So there is, uh, you know, YouTube is taking very uh, frictionless uh, approach to the, the future of video, where what we want is we want great programming brands that can connect with viewers on a much, you know, on a very emotional level to bring them to deeper consumption of video through YouTube. But we need the programmers for it. And for that, we need to set up the right economic framework for them to come to us. Today, we have a lot of programmers who don't mind uh, distributing on a net supported basis. We have broadcasters in different countries, whether it's India, Korea, Russia, etc., who de uh, deliver through us. Others don't. And there's a lot of shorter form content that gets uh, packaged into channels and distributed that way. And that's OK. Uh, so it's for us again. It's not about war. It's not about not about competition. It's more about how do we provide the right platform uh, for content providers to distribute through us. And in support, just to support what Robert said, uh, you know, we we do in markets do ad supported content as well. I mean, here in the Middle East, we have a Fox Movies channel, uh, and a Fox channel, and Abu Dhabi uh, National Geographic Abu Dhabi, all free satellite channels that are 100% ad supported. Um, that we develop and sure we window and on some of these channels we window the content so it's two or three years old on the Fox Movies channel or on the pay channel that would be airing the most recent content and and likewise on the, the web with YouTube and, and, and other uh, uh, platforms similar you know we, we are exploiting content because it's a great vehicle to raise awareness and ultimately with so much good content out there you can have the best show in the world but if people aren't aware that it exists um, no one's going to watch it. And I think broadcast television helps create awareness, and that's a traditional way of doing it. But obviously, YouTube and the internet, Google, I mean, they, they, there are many ways to raise awareness, and we have to use all of them to market our products. And, and probably one for you, Ward. I mean, it sounds like TV is going to get even more fragmented with viewers than it is now. And obviously, TV traditionally has been a great way to reach mass audiences. Is that going to be much tougher going harder? And does that mean? As you said, you're going to get the, have to get the best content, and therefore the price and the competition for the best content is going to get even fiercer. I think you know we feel that we need to be at all ranges of the spectrum. We have to have channels that are mass appeal and that are fully distributed and available everywhere over every platform. We we have to have more niche channels that people pay a premium for, but only a small number get get the content. And I think most importantly, we need to own, create, and own more content. So in every market in the world, not just in the United States. You know, that's one of the biggest focuses we have as an organization is not just being buying content and packaging it and, and giving it to the consumer, which is a very important thing. I mean, we've done a lot of research that shows, obviously, ultimately, the content is the most important thing 
to a consumer, but very close behind the content is the brand in which it's delivered. So, you know, we, you, you add value to the process when, you know, it, when you create a good environment. If you see the logo of National Geographic on the screen, people give a lot more credibility to that and they might stop and take a look at it, whether it's on the internet or whether it's on traditional TV. When they see that logo credibility stamp, let me check this out when an equally good documentary might just get passed by if it doesn't have that stamp on it, because people need help to navigate this plethora of great content. So we need to own and create more content. We have to keep packaging it well. I would actually uh, go further. I would, I would say that the brand is more important than the content, because in the world of unlimited shell space and in the world of uh, just unimaginable choices, uh, ultimately what people uh, will um, flock towards is trusted brands. And Nat Geographic is actually a great example. I don't know a single program on their channel. But I know that, you know, I watch it because I know their curatorial voice. I know what's on it in general. And I come to it because of that. And I know I find certain quality and certain programming slant. And that to me is more important than the individual pieces of content that they have. So I think that's actually the right, that's the best framework that you have for business where the brand itself is so powerful that the, each individual piece is actually worth less than the thing together. And when you have it, you have an incredibly robust business. Nagio is a fantastic example of a business that I will bet will survive hundreds of years uh, no matter what changes in the ecosystem. People understand exactly what Nagio means and when they see that, they'll watch it. Uh, you can have a lot of the same content disseminated in different places and you just simply don't know how to interact with it. And that's, by the way, that is, that precise thing is what's behind our push towards channelization of YouTube and making sure that we organize ourselves around other people's programming brands because we want people to develop, develop exactly that, those trusted brands that make sense of a lot of the content, whether it's long form, short form, user submitted, it doesn't matter. Uh, that's what we want to create. I'll, uh, I'll give an example. Dogs on skateboards on YouTube, randomly, $2 CPM. Dogs on skateboards inside the Tony Hawk skateboarding channel, $20 CPM. It just makes perfect business sense because suddenly you put things into a context and it makes sense to the viewer, makes sense to the advertiser. It's just better organization and putting a trusted brand, trusted curatorial brand around it. So I, I actually think you have even bigger gem on your hands than, uh, than you say. I should get Robert to come to some of my meetings with advertisers and affiliates, you know. I think uh, he said it better than I ever could. We're running out of time, so I want to ask a question to both of you quickly. We, we touched on a few themes. We touched on second screening, you know, over-the-top internet services, etc. Just very briefly, each of you, what, are, what, are the, what is the one big change trend that you would highlight that's going to change how we view going forward? So for us, uh, this is the first screen. So when we talk about second screen, I'll talk about television. <laughs> but uh, the big change that will come is that when you're seamlessly, uh, and it's today available through uh, some devices, but it's not available on the mainstream basis, but when you're making your selections on your phone and you're sending them to your TV instantly. And that's coming very soon. And for us, you know, we're focusing on this as the first screen and television as the second screen to us. Again, that's something we're doing different than TV industry, right? So we're tr trying to be complementary. Um, when that transition is seamless, uh, this becomes more of a first screen than the second screen to us. And what? Yeah, I mean, I think for us it's, we don't want to take our eye off of our, what we're doing today. I think we got to keep doing what we're doing. Uh, I don't think, again, I think Robert mentioned at the very beginning, but markets are different. So, especially in Asia, you have markets with 100% pay TV penetration like Taiwan and Korea. And what we're doing, what's important to us in that market is very different than what's important to us in Indonesia, the Philippines, or, uh, places where you have single digit pay TV penetration. So in, in markets where you have low pay TV penetration, I think it's business as usual in many ways. Obviously, we don't want to forget the fact that broadband penetration and other things are growing, but we don't want to take our eye off of the simple basics, which is get broadly distributed channels, have really compelling content, monetize that content. But, but in markets that are you know, more similar to the United States, like said, Taiwan, Korea, um, you know, clearly the things that Robert mentioned, you know, the um, interaction between your mobile and the television screen, the ability to easily navigate quality content on your mobile devices 
you know, as that happens, it's, it, it will change the way, much faster the way people consume television content. We need to be in step with that. And if, like I said, if we're, if we're not, we're in trouble. And I think we are making great steps. And I'm confident that, you know, with our good brands and with the money we have behind us and the investment and content we have, that we will be very competitive in that new space that will exist in five to 10 years in, in these highly connected markets. If I can squeeze one last question out of you both, if you want to be extremely brief, in five years' time, how are we going to be consuming TV? Um, again, depends on the market, obviously. But if you're thinking most, uh, you know, forward uh, invested and uh, developed markets, again, I, I think uh, you will start consumption on a mobile phone and send it to your TV. Um, you know, we're seeing that in Saudi Arabia. Again, 50% of our consumption is here. It's already the first screen for us in Saudi Arabia and Korea. Um, that is it. Uh, so the question is, what's the content on it and how it comes? And it's incumbent upon us to make sure that it's as robust as possible to make sure viewers uh, enjoy what they do. If we fail at that, then, um, then we don't get there. Uh, I, have a, I have the confidence to, to think that we will get there both on the technology level as well as on the content level. And more quickly. Uh, I think that, you know, the market, there'll be more and more windows, um, there'll be more fragmentation of viewing, all the trends that are happening today will continue to happen, and we have to adjust with, it, with the times. You have to have a plethora of pay TV channels, uh, some free TV channels, uh, both on traditional delivery and via the internet, um, on demand. Uh, we, we have to be platform agnostic, and, uh, but ultimately we have to own and create compelling content that we can, we can uh, determine the way that content is windowed. Because, uh, you know, it, it's just going to be easier and easier um, to get a hold of good content. And the way that you consume content on the television is pretty simple and easy today. And it's more challenging on the internet still to navigate that. But it's getting, it's getting simpler and more user friendly. And it's only going to happen at an accelerated rate. Right. That well, I'm sure everyone wants to go to lunch. But I'd like to thank you both for a really interesting debate. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks.